we'll get started. Good morning, good morning, friends. Tony Pellegrini here with Teaching and Learning at uh, Southern Utah University. Uh, I have Chris uh, Phillips with us today, and uh, we are just excited to be able to share with him one of the, uh, it's kind of a good news, bad news. I, I'm very appreciative of the president wanting more students, but what that means is more faculty, <laughs> <laughs> more people to learn, but wonderful people to learn. We have great faculty here, and I love learning about them and what the wonderful things that they are doing. Chris, would you mind taking a moment or two, introducing yourself, telling us a little about you, some, some information that we'd like to know about you? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, as you said, my name is Chris Phillips. Uh, this is my sixth year at SUU. Uh, I came after spending a year um, working full-time at Northern Michigan University in the Upper Peninsula, just a beautiful area right on Lake Superior there. Um, I did my PhD in philosophy at the University of Iowa, uh, completing that in 2014. Um, before that, I grew up in Michigan in the Lower Peninsula and uh, spent most of my life there. Um, and so thanks so much for having me here. I'm excited to be here. You're, we're excited to learn more about you, absolutely, to learn a, bit more, a little bit more about you. Uh, philosophy, tell us a little about the courses you teach. Would sure. you take a moment and tell us some of those? Yeah, um, well, the philosophy program here, uh, you know, is, is um, a pretty exciting program. We're growing uh, right along with the university, and uh, it's, it's really cool to see. Um, up until this year, I was one of two faculty members in the philosophy program, so I kind of teach a little bit of everything. Um, but Dr. Kirk Fitzpatrick and I uh, pretty much covered the whole curriculum. So I kind of get the sense you really like that, though. You I like love your it. okay, good. yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, it's uh, it, it, it keeps things fresh and and keeps me going. Um, so I've taught boy a whole bunch of things: intro to philosophy, intro to logic, uh, the advanced logic course that we offer. Um, I've taught. Uh, a class called Mind, Language, and Reality, uh, Theory of Knowledge, Modern Philosophy, which uh, focuses on European philosophy in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, I've taught senior seminar a couple of times. I've been fortunate enough to work with the folks in the honors program, uh, teaching a bunch of different classes for them in, in areas uh, uh, space and motion, time, um, uh, Geez, I can't even remember all of them, but there were a couple others, I think Sense um, and uh, Death uh, recently. So kind of all over the place. But wow. It's, it's a blast. That is wonderful. That is exciting. And that enthusiasm that you have, I think, really translates to your learners as well. I, I think so. I think so. Um, you know, I, I can see our students um, in the philosophy program are they're outstanding. They're really hardworking, bright students. Um, they're energetic, they're excited, they're doing all kinds of stuff, not just for the philosophy program, but university-wide, they're, uh, uh, they're kind of everywhere. They, ma they make our university move forward, don't they? Absolutely. They sure do. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, uh, with philosophy, uh, do you have a particular teaching style, any particular methods that you found over your last six years here and, and in northern Michigan as well, maybe that really uh, tend to engage your learners and, and help them to participate not only in class, but as you've outlined, outside of class as well? Um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to actually teaching in the classroom, uh, I tend to be a little bit old school. Um, I, I lean quite a bit on lecture. Um, but one of the things that I think is really critical for philosophy, and I'm sure it's true of other disciplines, but I'm not a specialist in anything else. Um, one of the things that's really critical is just um, not just talking at students, but getting them to engage. Uh, and so one of the things that I do that I think is often very frustrating for my students is I refuse to take a stand on any issue. Um, so we read philosophers, we read texts from philosophers, books, articles, whatever. Um, and I'll typically present two or three or four different positions about one topic. Uh, and while we're reading a particular author, I'm just going to defend that topic to the death and, and just take a stand on that. And then we'll read the next person who says that first one's wrong. And I'm just, I'm going to defend that. And I, I challenge the students to make up their own minds. Um, and so in that way, I try to get a dialogue going. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult, the material is, is challenging, it's pretty abstract, it's, it's kind of out there. Um, but, uh, you know, if you can kind of, kind of push them a little bit, say some really absurd or crazy things and, and make them think that I believe it, at least for the time being, then usually it gets them riled up enough. And, um, 
and then I think just that that kind of engagement, that back and forth, the you know, um, what these people are saying is important, but what's also equally important is whether you believe it and why. Uh, are, are you pretty upfront with your students as far as, you know, I'm not going to tell you what I believe or where I come from, because I could see a student saying, hey, wait a minute, you, you, you spoke <laughs> last week, like you really believe this, and now this week, oh my goodness, you really believe, what does Kurt really believe? <laughs> do you, do you, um, how, do you, how do you deal with that kind of disconnect in their minds? Oh, sure. Um, no, I, I'm pretty upfront about that. Uh, it's uh, much more at the, at the lower levels, at the intro levels. Um, I just say on day one, I'm not going to tell you what I think about this. Or sometimes they'll say, you know, I, I don't have any opinions. Um, that's of course false. I, I have lots Thank of strong you. opinions, but <laughs> um, you know, but uh, it's it's a tool because again, uh, part the biggest thing I think about philosophy is it's not teaching you what you should think; it's teaching you how to think about things. So I, at the end of the day, really don't care what position students end up taking on any topic at all. Um, you know, I might disagree with them but that's irrelevant. I want them to think carefully about it and come to their own conclusions for what are good reasons. So. I, I love what you just said. You know, I can disagree with students, but I can still love them and teach them and learn alongside them. Absolutely. Uh, I, I can absolutely disagree with you. And in our, in our world today, I see us getting more uh, compartmentalized or departmentalized or, or further along the ends of the continuum. I'm not sure how to really articulate it, but, yeah. but uh, being able to say, this is what I think, or this is what I believe, and why I do it, um, and not worrying about being put down or pressed down. So right. important to our to our young people today. I think so too. I think it's a I think it's a, 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 a an important component of their learning. Um, uh, we've talked a little about your teaching styles, your methods, your philosophies, your approaches. How do you try to, and, and, and maybe you've addressed this already, but could you go a little deeper in how you try to pull out from students their various learning styles? Mm -hmm. How they really, in philosophy, I'm sure you've got kids along a wide continuum of how they learn. Uh, how do you trust, uh, try to address those learners' needs in your classroom? Sure. Um, well, so I, I would say a variety of different ways. Um, I mean, again, a lot of students, um, you know, uh, uh, probably aren't all that excited about the lecture format. Um, but, but this is sort of where I think it's important um, to try to come up with new, interesting ways to get them to talk to one another, uh, to get them to engage with me, to kind of um, break it up so it isn't just 50 minutes or 75 heaven forbid, uh, of just talking at students about complex things. Um, so I've done a couple of different things in my intro classes. Uh, I, I have the students break up into groups and, and kind of really dive deep into a particular passage that I highlight for them. And I say, okay, figure out what's going on with this, talk to each other about it, work through it. Um, and that gets them both engaged. It gets me talking a little bit less. So they don't have to hear me all the time. Um, but also I think it, it kind of builds a, uh, an intellectual community in a sense. Um, you know, they get to know one another and can kind of learn from one another as much as, as from me. Um, so that's useful. Uh, assignments, I, I try to come up with new, sort of more interesting ways of doing the kinds of things that we do in philosophy, which to be honest is reading and writing papers. Uh, so one thing I'm really excited about, I'm trying out this year, I have a colleague at uh, York College in Pennsylvania who's teaching a theory of knowledge class, and I'm also teaching a theory of knowledge class. So instead of doing a traditional research term paper, uh, we're doing really short, focused papers, and um, we're doing kind of a virtual conference. So our students from both schools are going to swap papers through uh, Google Drive, um, and they're tasked with writing commentary on one another's papers. So they're getting comments from students across the country. Um, they're commenting on papers from students from across the country. And then when they get them back, they have to go through and I'm putting them in groups and, and kind of have a Q and A um, all digitally. So um, it you know, sounds like you're putting your own conference together almost. Basically. <laughs> um, and you know, not to mention, we do an annual undergraduate conference here on campus, but maybe we can come back to that. We, we will. I do have to, because you, you really just fascinated me a moment ago. Uh, I was going to ask you a question, you know, with these, with these uh, young people, it seems 
like they're constantly living off of their cell phones, their tablets, tablets, their computers. Um, uh, and I'm so grateful for the technologies, you know, using uh, sharing documents across the country with learners from across the country through Google Docs and those kinds of things. Other technologies that you tried to investigate at all or, or that students have said, you know, I can't put my phone down. Is there some way I could use that to, to be able to engage or work in your class? Anything at all like that? I uh, love what you're doing with Google Drive. I think well, that's great. You. Yeah, um, I'm pretty excited about that. I got to say it wasn't my idea originally. I'd love to take credit for it. Um, I, uh, I borrowed it from my colleague out, in, out at York College, uh, Dr. Stoutenberg. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, seems like the technology thing is kind of a losing battle. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to ban laptops in the classroom or something like that. But I, at this point, I've just leaned into it. If I ask people a question that's a, a relatively straightforward kind of definition question or, or just a even kind of a history question, um, I'll, I'll just kind of point out, hey, look, you have a computer in your hand. Go look it up. Use it. You what have a, this tool, well, this isn't, amazing resource. And, and, and isn't that a great problem solving tool? Uh, so I mean, great. don't you use problem solving skills in philosophy? I Absolutely. think that was <laughs> what you do. That's your bread and butter, what you do. How can we solve that's this right. problem yeah. in talking, reading, writing about the issues that we come into? Okay. Thank you so very much. Oh, sure. Uh, that is wonderful. Um, uh, you know, uh, love your enthusiasm, love your connection with your learners. Uh, has that always been there? How have you, how have you overcome or, or, or become such a great enthusiastic teacher to work with your learners? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I don't know. Uh, okay. uh, that's a really great question. So um, uh, growing up, uh, my dad was an English professor for 42 years uh, teaching in Michigan. And um, I think just kind of watching him uh, interact with students, watching him teach, watching him, just being around him all the time. Um, I just kind of picked up, probably not consciously, but just sort of picked up some of the, some of the things that he did. Uh, as far as where the enthusiasm comes from, I just really like doing philosophy. And I think it's really cool that my job is to, um, well, read and think about and talk about really interesting things. Um, with people who more often than not are also interested in those things. Um, and so big picture wise, I think that's where the enthusiasm comes from. It's just kind of, I can't believe I get to do this. This is a, this is a career. This is amazing. It's absolutely awesome. We still want to get paid though. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. See, we still, we still, we still like that. Absolutely. We love it. It's a great, it's a great passion, but, but we like, uh, we like uh, being compensated for it as oh, well. For sure. <laughs> um, kind of along those same lines, uh, you know, you um, have talked about, you know, this uh, interest and enthusiasm and it's your, your wonderful model that your father gave you um, to help you be such a great teacher. Uh, but certainly, certainly, there uh, are times in your life as a professor, as an individual, a learner, a leader, that um, uh, you have passions and, and knowledge uh, about uh, concepts that are important to you, but others really maybe not believe exactly how you believe <laughs> how, or, or agree with you, uh, agree with you on particular topics. Yeah. Can you talk to us for a moment or two about how you deal with that or, or, or what's something that's really true to you that you're passionate about, but really maybe nobody really agrees with you on? <laughs> Boy, uh, there are so many things I would say uh, that I think are, are probably right um, where virtually no one agrees with me. Um, if I had to narrow it down, if I had to pick one thing, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I made this pitch. I, uh, I was invited back to uh, my alma mater. I did a, a master's degree uh, before my PhD at Western Michigan. And they invited me to come back for um, a kind of an alumni weekend. So I went and, and gave a talk uh, where I argued that um, everyone in society has an obligation both to themselves and to others um, to continue to study the liberal arts, um, the sort of classic sense of the liberal arts. So you facility with mathematics, with science, with literature, with the fine arts, with philosophy, with all of these different things. We, we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to everybody else. Um, and, uh, you know, um, 
it seemed relatively well received, uh, but as is often the case when philosophers make an argument, um, you know, somebody's out to get somebody's you. out <laughs> to get me, uh, and it seemed like there were a whole bunch of folks who were out to get me that, that wow. day. Wow! Um, and maybe they didn't like the idea that that it's an obligation, that it's uh, there's this sort of moral component to it. Um, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's right, and uh, you know. Um, I think part of the beauty of being a philosopher um, or a student of philosophy or even just somebody who studies it on their own um, is, is sort of being open to being wrong about stuff. Uh, I always tell my intro students, and, and this is maybe another thing that nobody agrees with me about, um, it's, uh, it's kind of awesome to be wrong about things. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't heard many say that. Either. Yeah, um, but I think it's, it's awesome to be wrong because then you get to learn new stuff. Um, you know, being right all the time would be really boring. Um, it, it just seems like you wouldn't be able to move forward. Um, and I think those two are related. So, um, you know, even when people are out to get me, even if they don't buy it, even if they think what I'm, what I'm trying to convince them of is, is weird or problematic or pointless or something like that, cool. Um, show me why I'm wrong. And, and if I am, I'll, I'll happily admit it and I'll, I'll accept what now seems right. And can talk about it. I think, you know, coming from my education background, you know, we look at learners as lifelong learners. We're continually learning. Right. We're never there. I don't know that I'm ever going to be there. <laughs> there. Uh, we want to continually learn. And so um, I, I think those are wonderful skills to be able to take away from a university experience uh, that they enjoy with you. You'd mentioned, um, just one last question, you'd mentioned uh, another topic that we want to, to say for another time, but we have a moment or two now, and, and I am embarrassed. I've been talking about too many things. Oh, Can you remember what we were talking, what the, uh, the theme was? Was it the undergraduate conference? I, well, I think so. I think it might have been. Yes, would yes. you take a moment and just tell us a, a little bit of an advertisement here? That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, boy, it's, a, it's one of the coolest things um, I think about teaching at SUU uh, is our undergraduate philosophy conference. So um, for the past five years, the entire time that I've been here, uh, the philosophy club and the students affiliated with it have, uh, have put in just unbelievable amounts of work in preparing what is now an internationally recognized undergraduate conference. Um, so starting right about this time, uh, early October, we, we get funding requests together, we put together a budget um, and uh, reach out to a, uh, a hopefully nationally renowned scholar bring them to campus as our keynote, um, put out a call for papers, and we solicit papers from around the country. Uh, last year, our fifth year, um, it was a fantastic conference. We had, I think, over 42 submissions uh, from three or four different countries. Oh my goodness. Um, obviously all over the United States, and then also Canada, I think Greece and Belgium. Oh my goodness. Um, so, uh, unbelievable. Uh, and then the students, with, uh, with our help, um, work through all those submissions, look at them, and pick the top four. And we bring those four students to campus and uh, put together a day-long undergraduate research symposium, basically. And it is just awesome. It's what wonderful practical problem solving skills, yeah. uh, real world skills that they can transfer to whatever jobs they're going to, whether it's in teaching or, or whatever jobs they're going to have in the future. I think those are wonderful opportunities. Yeah. And uh, you, you may not buy this, but I'm going to just at least try to show <laughs> invite your dad to come sometime. <laughs> I think he'd have a great time there. I, I would love to get my dad out here. I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. Um, Chris, any last minute things that you'd like to share? Anything that I haven't covered that you'd really like to, to, to share? Hmm. Um, you know, I should have I had something in my back pocket ready to go here. You've shared a lot. Um, You've shared a lot, I <laughs> promise you. Um, maybe I'll just throw this one out here, uh, just a last minute pitch for the philosophy program itself. Um, you know, sometimes people, people I think, uh, hear philosophy, um, they have maybe little to no understanding of what it is or what they think is that it's weird and impractical. Um, but again, one of the things that I kind of try to convince my students is uh, in, in many ways, this is the most practical kind of discipline. Uh, whatever job you're going to go into, you need to communicate effectively. You need to think carefully. You need to be able to problem solve, as you've been saying. Uh, and ultimately, 
at least as the as the Greeks conceived of of the purpose of philosophy, it was learning for the sake of living well, and we all want to do that. And so, if you dedicate your life to the study of knowledge and and wisdom and uh, the practical applications of these things and the pursuit of living well, uh, I don't see how that could possibly be impractical. I, I have a I, uh, maybe I'm Pollyanna, but I have a hope for the future. And with those particular skills, we can only make a better future. I really think we can only make a better future. Friends, uh, if you have an opportunity, get into Chris's class, watch some of the things that he does, take him to lunch here on campus, and uh, uh, let him know your appreciation for him. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for the the opportunity to visit with you today and with Chris. Chris, thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you soon. Make it a good day, and we'll see you soon. Thanks one and all.